Nokia has announced the 6760 slide in Europe and the surge in the States. It's a messaging and social network centric phone with 2.4 inch display, slide out full width keyboard, 3 megapixel camera, GPS and a 2 gigabyte micro SD card included. Not bad for £180 or €200. Euros. HTC has finally, finally started to move away from the hated ex-USB jack, stating that, quote, the vast majority of devices we launch after the hero will have a 3.5mm jack, end quote. That may sound like a trivial complaint, but the lack of a proper standard audio out jack has been a frustration for just about every HTC user at some time or other. Welcome to 2009, HTC. Files on Ovi, now just called Ovi Files, always the least sexy of Nokia's Ovi services, has changed from a commercial into a free service. Possibly driven by poor take-up, Nokia has simply made it free for all, and is quoted as saying that existing unused subscription periods will be refunded. Interesting. The Symbian Foundation has announced Symbian Horizon, a non-profit making application publishing program which aims to help developers place applications in the likes of Nokia's Ovi Store, Samsung's Application Store and AT&T's Media Mall. The idea of being a publisher in this way has a lot of legs and I wish it well. Nokia has released their quarter two 2009 results. The financials weren't too hot, but Nokia's world smartphone market share was up at 41%. And Nokia's 17 million smartphones sold in the quarter still look healthy enough to me, to be honest, being twice as much as all the iPhone and BlackBerry sales combined. So don't shed too big a tear for the Nokia shareholders. Still, credit to Apple who have also announced quarterly figures selling 5 million iPhones of various flavours and with profits actually increasing by an impressive 15%. Do any of these scenarios sound familiar? This rant is for all those of you using a phone with just a numeric keypad. You're standing with a casual acquaintance and they're trying to give you the details, spelling out their name and address by turning off the predictive dictionary and then using multi-tap takes forever. As a result, you search around for a piece of paper and a pen. You're out and about, keeping in touch with the world using a Twitter client like Gravity. And now you want to join in the global conversation with a few tweets, but even at 140 characters, it's going to take you a minute or two at the very least for each tweet. Hardly dashing off a quick thought, is it? You're in the queue at the bank and you check your email. Oh, there's a message that absolutely has to have a response immediately. You start tapping out a reply using the predictive text dictionary, but after 15 or so words, two of them guessed wrong by the predictive system, you realise it's going to take 10 minutes to spell out everything you need to say. So you close your smartphone, grit your teeth, waiting for when you're back at the office and can deal with it properly. You're waiting for a train and have a spare 20 minutes. Ideally, you want to have a good look through your to-do list or bash out some thoughts into a new report you're supposed to be putting together. But you forgot to bring your rather bulky fold-up Bluetooth keyboard or its batteries have perhaps failed. As a result, you fire up a game instead. What about those occasions where you need to put in text with some punctuation and have to pick your way around a character grid very, very slowly? And then there are other occasions where you seem perpetually in the wrong input mode and have to keep going back and switching again and again. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that you need to be productive and in work mode every minute of every day. But if you don't want to be limited by the form factor of your smartphone or communicator, then a keyboard of some kind built in really is necessary. Day in, day out, having a mobile device with a usable keyboard means that you'll input more useful text more often. And as a result, the way you use your smartphone or communicator will change subtly. The relative ease of text input will encourage you to use contact notes, to-do lists, calendar entries, notes, uh, making you better organised, better informed and better focused. Then there's entering text into other applications, including word processors, Twitter clients, instant messaging applications, all heavily text-based. Every time I stray into trying to live with a phone that only has a numeric keypad, I find myself being limited and constrained. I always come back to QWERTY. The virtual QWERTY is on the iPhone and Nokia 5800, maybe, or physical QWERTY as on the HTC Touch Pro 2 and Nokia E75. It's very much up to you. The former tend to be slower, but you do gain the screen real estate back when you finish typing. The latter, physical QWERTY, tends to be faster and more satisfying, and you do get to see all the screen all the time but you do have the inefficiency of uh, all those bits of plastic. Your call and comments welcome. Now here's an interesting discovery. 
You know that when you try to use digital zoom on camera phones, especially in video mode, you normally get horrible pixelation and blocky results? Well, what you're seeing now is on the Nokia N86 8 megapixels, already reviewed, of course, in this show. But what I've since found out is that, as demonstrated here, the full 8 megapixel sensor is used when shooting video. Not only does this make video shot in poor light possible, it also means that real digital zoom is possible. Since as long as the sensor area being used is greater than the VGA resolution of the clip itself, there's still detail in hand, so to speak. The end result is that the Nokia N86's digital zoom is pretty effective. Here's a clip where I start zoomed in, and then I zoom out. Remember, this is being shot on a phone. Uh, results aren't quite as crisp as if it had an optical zoom. Anybody remember the N93? Uh, but they're good enough for most purposes, and with admirable light sensitivity. Anyway, I just thought you'd like to know. And yes, the N86 is what I shoot the phone show on these days. And so, somewhat belatedly, the Samsung i8910 HD arrives in my hands, not crippled by orange either. This is the SIM-free network free model. There's no point in repeating my, my detailed preview from Show 78. Do please co watch that if you haven't already. What's important here is my opinion, my verdict of the device, and of Samsung's support infrastructure. Firstly, though, the name change. I know it's a trivial thing, but Omnia HD was memorable, easy to say, like iPhone. <laughs> The i8910 HD does not trip off the tongue, and it's not easy to write down properly either. Samsung's marketing people being overcautious, I think, and making a mistake. Secondly, the device itself is A, still utterly gorgeous, and B, a fingerprint magnet, but a super magnet. Don't ever use this after a fish and chip supper. The 3.7 inch OLED screen is still virtually unparalleled in the phone world. It's not brilliant in direct sun, but it, it rocks in every other environment. Thirdly, the i8910 HD, see how I hate saying it, is still blindingly fast at almost everything. 150 megabytes of free RAM, a fast main processor, cutting edge OMAP 3430 accelerated graphics inside mean that web pages render faster, uh, videos play more smoothly, even DivX ones. Uh, Games would play more smoothly too if there were any written for Symbian OS that actually used all this graphics power. Time will tell on this one though. Fourthly, the camera and camcorder. You'll already know how highly I think of it. Eight megapixel stills like this one and a decent sensor, although the LED flash is a bit weedy. So this is a rough and ready test clip on the Samsung i8910 HD with the new IG2 firmware, which introduces better audio quality. Uh, as you can see, Samsung have more or less sorted the audio-video sync issues which have plagued them, which is good to see. Interestingly, there's no uh, initial focus in video mode, unlike uh, previous Samsung S60 devices. You're stuck with a preset focus, uh, N95 style, but that's okay. And the sun's coming out, which is nice. So this is a test of footage at full max resolution. That's like 1280 by 720 pixels by 30 frames a second at 75 megabytes per minute of footage. So that's going to eat up your memory card. My review i8910 HD had 8 gigabytes of flash memory, but there's also a 16 gigabyte version, and you can add to this with micro SD. Though I was disappointed to see so little flash memory allocated to disk C, the system disk, only 40 megabytes total. What this means is that applications have to be installed to the mass memory uh, instead. Not a huge problem. And I've mentioned free RAM, there's 154 megabytes free after booting, a revelation compared to the paltry. 45 megabytes or so on the Nokia N97, and it makes a big difference. You can run a dozen applications at once, load up the hugest web pages all at the same time, catch the largest videos, all of these things at the same time, play in theory the most ambitious 3D games, and I guarantee you will never ever get an out of memory message. Now that's what you call a smartphone. Now, what about software and support? You can write off some of Nokia's extra tools like Sports Tracker, as Share Online, and Obby Store, since these are a lot to Nokia devices. However, Samsung have filled some of the gaps. Communities goes one better than Share Online by allowing, for example, YouTube uploads. Uh, and Download here links through to a commercial app store. A Samsung own brand download portal is imminent. The numbers of S60 apps which spit the dummy when asked to install on Samsung hardware is thankfully decreasing, partly because of more certificates under the hood here and partly because of wider developer awareness. I had no trouble installing and enjoying Gravity, SPB TV, 
Google Maps, Google YouTube client, for example. In terms of support, Samsung are gradually getting better at firmware updates, but I do emphasize gradually. I was able to update the firmware of the i 910 HD using the supplied PC Studio suite, but note that there's no user data preservation a la Nokia, so do your backups first and then restore afterwards. There's also no over-the-air patching or updates, rather disappointingly. The device will need a fair number of updates to I encountered numerous serious bugs from web crashing to gallery freezing to video editing and podcasting being simply broken. You may remember I had issues with the S60 virtual keyboard on the Omnia HD prototypes capacitive touchscreen. Although still rather tricky because of the lack of multi-touch, Samsung have optimised things nicely with haptic vibration and typewriter sample sounds to help identify which screen taps get recognised and the result is quite fun. You may have noticed that I've not mentioned the much-hyped widget home screen. Sorry to be negative, but this is an utter gimmick. Almost no live data is shown in these. The home screens simply become places to put shortcuts to applications, rather duplicating the main S60 app menu that you get to when you press the home button. In practice, I just ignored the widgets altogether, and you will too. Again, see my earlier preview in Show 78 for more of the baseline interface and functions of the i8910 HD. My overall verdict? True to type, this Samsung S60 smartphone packs huge functionality, but as usual, investing in one is a bit of a gamble in terms of ongoing firmware and software support. It'll be an interesting ride though, you could be sure of that. Another phone show, another request for donation. This is part of my full-time job bringing you this show, so I do rely on your support. If you have any spare PayPal, dollars or pounds, then please consider sending some of them to this address or this form. Thanks very much.